Luke 18, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shalt not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We certainly thank you for the good singing. Thank you that you have provided this place for us to come and worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. And thank you, Lord, for these thy dear people, their sacrifice and their love. And Lord, their service unto God. Now, Father, you alone know every need of every heart here tonight. You know what's going on in people's minds right now. Lord, I pray that for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about us and you'd uh, bind the powers of hell. And I pray that, Lord, you'd break through and help folks tonight. Lord, I pray that, God, every need would be met through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those working with our young people over on the other side. Lord, we thank you for those young people. We thank you for their service to you. We thank you for their love for you. Lord, their desire to live for you. What a blessing in this day and age. And I pray for them. I pray that, Lord, you would hedge their lives in. And I pray that, God, what they get tonight will help sustain them in this week when they're out in this old wicked world. And for the next few minutes, Father, just meet with us. Use this unworthy vessel and glorify your namesake. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As introduction, I want you to notice a couple things. Uh, first thing I want you to notice is the plight of the widow. Look in verse number 3, we find the Bible says, And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Now, I don't know what's going on in this widow's life. I don't know who her adversary is. I don't know uh, why it is vexing her so much that she is coming before the judge. Uh, but she's coming before the judge continually, and this unjust judge, this judge that doesn't fear God, this judge that doesn't regard man, uh, this judge uh, is bothered uh, by this widow woman. Uh, but look what she says. She says, avenge me of mine adversary. Now this is a parable. This is not a true story. This is a, a, a story that the Lord is telling that has an earthly meaning but a hidden heavenly truth. Uh, and what the Lord is uh, revealing is that this woman is troubled by an avenger, uh, by an adversary. And can I say that you and I have an adversary. We have an adversary uh, as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking uh, whom he may devour. My dear friends, uh, our adversary doesn't fight fair. Uh, our adversary will uh, uh, deal with the very certain things uh, in our lives that are precious to us and will work on us. Uh, he'll uh, 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 put our children in peril to work on our hearts. Uh, he'll put things in our minds to work on our minds. Uh, and if you're not careful, the adversary will make you feel like you're worthless, uh, make you feel like God doesn't love you, uh, make you feel like there is no mercy available for you anymore. You've used it all up, uh, just like that song she sang. Uh, but aren't you glad uh, when it looks like the adversary's about ready to overtake you, he, the Lord, steps in again, reminds you he's on the throne, uh, reminds you that uh, he is in control, uh, and reminds you he's got more grace and more mercy than we can ever exhaust. Uh, but she has a plight. She's got an adversary. Notice the persistence of the widow. 
Verse number four, the judge says, uh, And he would not for a while, but afterward, uh, afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, uh, I will avenge her, lest uh, by her continually coming she weary me. Uh, notice, uh, this widow woman just kept coming before him uh, in this parable until the judge got tired of looking at her. Now I know they used to say it's the greasy or it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Right. Mm. Right. It's them things that needle you and bother you and bother you, and you finally going to do something about it. Mm. Mm. When all everything's running well, it doesn't bother you. Right. But this widow woman got under this uh, unjust judge's skin by her continual coming. She is troubling him, and can I say? Some of you are not getting much from God because you're not troubling him. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. Mm -mm. That song Miss Brittany sang this morning. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. When's the last time you just went before the Lord? And I'm not talking about just casually throwing something towards him. I'm talking about coming before him broken. Because if it's troubling you, it'll trouble him. Amen. Notice, if you will, the privilege of belonging to God. Look at verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Can I say? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Right. If you're troubled tonight, if you're weighted down tonight, if you're heavy hearted tonight, if there's something that is pricking you or bothering you tonight, there is a release and a relief available. Amen. When you get tired enough to quit dealing with it and bring it before the Lord, it's, the Bible says that he will avenge you speedily. But if you want to carry that load yourself, the Lord will let you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. And uh, guess what? He's not obligated to help you unless you ask him. Right. Amen. Mm -mm. Notice the peril of our day. Verse number 8 again. He said, Nevertheless, beyond the fact that God will help us speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now he's not talking about our faith to believe in God, us being saved. He's talking about, how about this world? Is there faith in this world to trust in God? You know, when uh, Jesus said that his coming would be like as in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, man's thoughts were evil only continually. Amen. There is hope for our day and age because there are still some people out there wanting to know if there's a God. Right. But as time goes on and Christians quit shining their light, quit being what we're supposed to be, guess what? Faith begins to dwindle out there that there is any hope beyond themselves. And the indictment is, Jesus says, when he comes, will he find faith? Will he find people seeking after the Lord? You know, the Bible says, seeking you shall find. Right. You know, if lost people want to know who God is, God will work it out by sending somebody their way to let them know who he is. Amen. So I don't believe that. I've told this story. It's a true story. Over in the deep regions of the jungles in Africa, they have a ritual that a, a young man, when he reaches the age of 13 or so, uh, They'll send him out for 30 days out into the wild. He's got to uh, uh, live off the land. He's got to feed himself, kill and hunt for food and everything. And he comes back after 30 days. And when he comes back, if he survived, then they have a big festival. And they uh, dawn him as being a man. Because he's proven he's worthy of the title of being a man. And one young man, he was out on his... Uh, uh, plight and he's out there in the jungles and he's laying there one night and he looks up and he sees the vast majority of the stars Now, one thing about living close to the city we can't see the stars you get out in the country you can see stars he's out there in the middle of nowhere no lights anywhere and he looks up and he sees all them stars and he gets to wondering about who put all them stars there and he just asked a question he looked up to the heavens he said who are you he comes back, they have the big, big festival, they dawn him a man. The very next day, two missionaries come into town, began to preach to him. The whole village, including the chief, got born again. 
That young man wanted to know who God was, so God sent the answer. Amen. Can I say, seek and ye shall find. Uh, save people, shame on us for uh, 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 not uh, tapping into the Lord and asking the Lord and having the Lord show us our needs. Uh, but can I say, even in this wicked old world, if there's somebody out there who wants to know him, God will send somebody by their way uh, to show them who he is. Uh, now notice the point to be taken from all this. Look in verse number 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. My dear friends, we're to always to have an attitude of prayer. Amen. And we're not to faint in our prayer life. God help us. It's amazing. The most powerful thing known to man is prayer. Amen. And the most neglected thing in God's people's lives is prayer. Right. He said men ought always to pray and not to faint. And I want to preach with God's help on this thought tonight. I want to preach on what will keep us from fainting. What will keep us from fainting. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Can I say that a lot of times we apply that verse as being weary in body, being tired. And I know we live in a sleepless society and we all wish we had another 12 hours in a day. If we did, we'd still use it up for something. We'd still be tired. We'd still be weary. We'd still be worn out. Some of you look like your mother-in-law moved in with you for the last two weeks because you look pretty wore out tonight, huh? But can I say that it does apply physically, but more importantly, uh, we're wearied in our minds. Yeah, right. Our minds never rest. Uh, and we constantly are dealing with things in our minds and we uh, allow our minds to be wearied and that keeps us from praying. That causes us Amen. to faint. Again, it says, let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know why a lot of people aren't reaping blessings? They fainted. Yeah. Hmm. Amen. God help us not to faint. Yeah. We shall reap if we faint not. So what will keep us from fainting? I got to think about this the other day. The Lord gave me this thought the other day. For I knew he was heading out of town. So the Lord gave me this thought before I headed out of town. What will keep us from fainting? Can I say the first thing that will keep us from fainting is a fresh glimpse of Calvary. Yeah. When was the last time you and your mind went to Calvary? When was the last mind uh, you saw the darling Son of God suspended between heaven and earth, uh, bleeding and dying for your sin, uh, for my sin? Uh, when was the last time uh, you saw him beat me on recognition? When was the last time uh, you saw him plucking his beard from his face? Uh, when was the last time you saw his head plaited with a crown of thorns? Uh, when was the last time you saw... Uh, evil men clearing their throats and spitting on the Son of God. Uh, when was the last time you saw evil men mocking him uh, and cussing him? Uh, when was the last time uh, you saw him look up to heaven and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, uh, hey, the Father and the Son broke fellowship uh, so you and I could have fellowship with the Son. Uh, when was the last time uh, you saw what Jesus went through uh, uh, to extend you grace, uh, to to extend you mercy, uh, to extend you forgiveness of sins, uh, to robe you in his righteousness, uh, to make you an heir to the throne of God, uh, uh, to allow you to be adopted into the family of God. Uh, had it not been what Jesus did on Calvary, uh, we'd be lost. Uh, we'd have no hope. Uh, we wouldn't be in church tonight. Uh, we'd be out worshiping some devil thing. Uh, hey, what a blessing to be saved. Uh, it's hard to faint uh, when you got your mind on Calvary and what Jesus done for you and I. When was the last time you thought about Calvary? Hmm. When you want to quit, if you look at Calvary, you can't quit. Right? I've told this story, but I'm getting old and I don't remember when I told it, so I'm going to tell it again. 
You know what I'm talking about, Phil. I'll never forget. Mr. Marcy, you remember when Miss Annette and I was at Orchard Street. We had, Jordan was a baby. And uh, I don't know why you like them. Because they're the ones that plucked us away from Orchard Street. And here you're sitting by them. Huh? Yeah. Tell, tell me there is forgiveness right there. I'm telling you. What a blessing. By the way, if you don't know it, them two women right there are crazy. They went to every Dollar Tree in northern Kentucky to see if they had different stuff. It's all a buck. A buck and a quarter. It's nothing good. Trust me. It's all made in China. Huh? They went to every one in one day. Went to every Dollar Tree in north. Every one. Like 25 or 30 of them. They're crazy. Anyway, I mean, that's crazy stuff, ladies. Come on. And they did all that, and they spent eight bucks at the stores and $40 in gas. <laughs> anyway, the Lord, in his infinite wisdom and great sense of humor, down there at Victory, Brother Ray and his family and all them that were in Victory, they needed a pastor. And uh, the Lord called Miss Annette and I down there to pastor. I didn't want to go. It was nothing to do with Brother Ray or Miss Pam. didn't even know them. What to do with anything with Brother Sherman, Miss Betty. I didn't even know them. But I knew the history of the church. I knew they'd had some problems. And I was pretty satisfied just sitting on the you know, second row, third row there at Orchard Street. But see, it's a problem when you get satisfied. <coughs> and the Lord sent us down there. Before the Lord sent us down there, there was a family down there. I won't go into all of it, but let me help you something. Oh, what a family. Brother Sherman, his, his father warned me about the family. Make you look normal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> huh? well, this family, first year or so I was down there, I mean, you would have thought they was model church members. But then they showed themselves. And they began to show themselves. And it began to vex me as the pastor. It began to vex the church. And I forget, I was staining a deck. And I've told this story, I hate staining. I don't mind painting. Staining is a nasty job. I mean, staining and cleaning out cisterns all kind of go together. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I'm having a pity party. I'm thinking about the job I'd left thinking about what I'd put my family through, driving down there to Owen 10 every, every week and all that we was doing. I'm out staining when I used to sit behind a desk with a shirt and tie on. And I'm thinking oh, I'm having a pity party. I'm thinking about all that's going on in the church and all that's... And Brother Ron, I, I can very distinctly remember asking the Lord, do you want me to quit? And I didn't hardly get it out of my mouth. And Brother Bob, he said... Did I quit on the way to Calvary? He said, what'd you do, preacher? I got the stain in that deck. I said, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. I got that deck done quick. And I'm sorry, Lord. And the Lord kept me from fainting because of Calvary. And I say, when you get a glimpse of Calvary, you won't want to quit. You won't want to stop. You won't want to stay where you are you'll want to honor the Lord with your life. Right. Talk about what will keep us from fainting. A fresh glimpse of Calvary. Can I say, it's been mentioned all day today, what will keep us from fainting is a faithful prayer life. A faithful prayer life. The book of Jude verse 20 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. If we will build ourselves up in faith, and we will pray through the Spirit of God... Uh, my dear friends, you won't faint. Amen. These little, now I'd lay me down the, the sleep prayers and you pray something that you half-heartedly even are in, into when you're praying it and the Lord doesn't uh, open the Red Sea of your life and perform a miracle in the next 10 minutes uh, and you get so discouraged you're ready to throw in the town and quit. That's not what we're talking about. 
We're talking about building yourself up in faith. How do you build yourself up in faith? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You get in the Bible. You get to listening to preaching. Uh, you get to applying preaching to your life. Uh, uh, you get to your faith increasing. Then you get into where you plug into the spirit of God. Uh, 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 that Romans 8 type of praying. Uh, where you get to the point where you've run out of words. Uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, uh, takes what's in your heart. And he intercedes and goes to the throne. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Faithful praying that touches the heart of God. Amen. You ever see a little child at a toy store wanting everything in the store and mama went there to buy something for somebody else and that child, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Mama never hears that. But in the middle of the night that child breaks out with a cry because something's hurting. Mama's right there. She can't but hear that. Can I say... A lot of our prayer life is just annoying God. When we get to where we plug into God and our prayer life honors God, he'll hear what's really in our hearts. I want you to know something about this woman's prayer. Notice this widow's prayer in verse number 3. It said, avenge me of mine adversary. Can I say that her prayer is not eloquent? I didn't see any these and thous and impressive words there. Can I say it's not elaborate? She don't go into a whole lot of details. And it's not elongated. It's only five words. Can I say little is much when God's in it? You don't need to grab the horns of the altar and stay there for three weeks to get God's attention. You just got to be where God wants you to be and offer up your heart to God. She got to the point and God answered. By the way, when... Elijah prayed down fire from heaven. It was only 60 something words. Hmm. God help us to realize that a faithful prayer life, full of faith that honors God, will keep you from fainting. I promise you every person who faints in the walk of faith does not have a good prayer life. Hmm. It amazes me, Brother Tony, Folks will call and complain to others, but they won't talk to God about it. Yeah. Amen. Mm. Mm. Amen. Can I say this, Brother Donald? He knows what you have need of before you do. Right. Right. What he wants us to do, Brother Seth, is recognize the need and recognizes he's the only one that can help us. Yes. That's what God wants. God wants us to come before him and say, Lord, you know this better than me, but Lord, I just figured this out and what I need you. And when we become honest before God God will speak but can I say when you got a faithful prayer life you won't faint you got a fresh glimpse of Calvary in your mind you won't faint can I say thirdly when we focus on Jesus we won't faint can I say everybody that faints their focus is on themselves I've got this problem, I've got that problem, this is going on in my life, that's going on in my life, God don't care, God don't have enough mercy, God doesn't have, it's all about me. Yeah. Well listen, there's nobody came in this building to worship you. Right. Right. We come to worship the Lord. Yeah. But see, your focus isn't right, and that's why you have a problem, that's why you're about ready to faint. Because your focus isn't right. My Sunday school class knows this verse well. We've been teaching on it the last couple of weeks. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. That word, that contradiction, means direct opposition. Jesus was directly opposed by people who were full of the devil, Yet he still went to the cross for the joy that was set before him because he knew that was the only way you and I could be saved. Right. And when we consider all that he went through and we focus on him, guess what? We won't faint. Amen. We won't faint. We won't become wearied. When we see how much Jesus loved us, we will not faint. But when you're focusing on Jesus, you're going to faint. Mm. 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 can I say that they say the hardest thing in sports 
is not driving a golf ball 300 yards, although I wish I could drive a golf ball consistently 300 yards. I can drive one 300 yards if I got a good wind behind me and it hits nice hard ground and rolls a long ways. Huh? They say not the hardest thing in sports is not hitting a hockey putt through a hockey goal, although I think standing on ice and hitting a, a, a round object through a net would be, you know, pretty, pretty big feat. They say it's not the hardest thing to do. They say the hardest thing is not to throw a perfect spiral of a football, although I've seen Seth do it, and, you know, if he can do it, anybody ought to be able to do it, huh? That's not the hardest thing to do. They say the hardest thing to do in sports is hit a 90 mile an hour fastball because it takes hand and eye coordination and focus. Our problem today is focus. The devil's very crafty and he's hard at work getting our attention other places. So when the ball comes we're swinging and missing. We're focused on everything. I'm sick and tired of election ads, but we're focused on an election. And to be honest with you, our country is in the balance over this election. Amen. This one goes wrong, we'll never have America back. Right. Listen, I was just in Michigan. I'm talking about as far away from culture as you and I would think. I'm talking about we're not near D.C., it's not near a big city. I was in the middle of nowhere, and all I saw was immigrants. They're so thick up there that the lawyers actually have advertising on their law firm buildings that they're immigration lawyers. Why do they need that many immigration lawyers in Michigan? Because they're trying to throw the election. They're trying to get these people citizenship so they can vote. I'm talking about... I was wondering if I was not, I made a wrong turn. I wasn't north. I didn't think I was near our northern border. I thought I was near our southern border. I mean, it was bad. Here they are, and none of them can drive. Hmm. And I, I, I'm going to have to apologize to our local politicians and all the roundabouts. You ought to see up there. Up there. You turn right onto a four-lane road. To go a quarter of a mile, and you got to get in the far left lane so you can do a U-turn to make a left turn where you, first of all, could just make a left turn at a light. But they don't do that. you got to go and put yourself in peril to do a U-turn to go left. I've never seen anything like it. But I guess that's how immigrants drive, because they're crazy. What I'm saying is, boy, you get to thinking about all that's at stake for our country. We can lose our focus. We're supposed to have our minds on our heavenly country. Right. Yeah. And all the folks that aren't going to be citizens over there Amen. if we don't start sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm, can I say we focus on our jobs and you ought to focus on your job. You ought to do a good job on your job. And while you're at your job, you ought to work. Because the Bible says a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Amen. You shouldn't be a bum on your job. Amen. Huh? We, we focus on our jobs. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we bring the job home. We're not focusing on the Lord. Can I say we focus on everything in the world? As a matter of fact, we've got so many things that are at our uh, dis disposal so that we can just kind of zone out and not focus on anything. And the problem is, is we're fainting because we don't take time to focus on Jesus. I'm trying to help you, what will keep you from fainting? Can I say what will keep you from fainting is feasting on the Word of God. I don't know. I'm looking around. Doesn't look like too many of us have missed too many meals. I'm not going to call anybody out. Oh, I want to, but I won't. Uh, how come we understand the importance of natural food, but we don't understand the importance of spiritual food? Amen. Psalm 119, verse number 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You start hiding the word of God in your heart, you won't faint. Right. 
Can I say that we, we have preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We have Sunday school. We have teaching for every age. We have a Bible institute. All of it's available online. Uh, can I say that uh, we, we try to get as much Bible into people as we can. We have ladies meetings. We have men's meetings. We have all kinds of things to help us with the Word of God. Plus you have a Bible in your lap. Right. But yet we neglect our spiritual nutrition. Amen. God help us. God help us. It'll cause you to faint. Have you ever not eaten? You know, and you, you get busy doing stuff, and you might have bent down, and then you go to stand up, and everything gets kind of woozy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's wrong with us spiritually. We haven't eaten and we're trying to stand, having done all to stand, stand therefore, and we're lightheaded. Amen. And if you're not careful, you might faint. But if you have a steady diet, you're not going to faint. And I say what will keep us from fainting is the fear of the Lord. Now I know some mean, nasty preachers but they don't put the fear of the Lord in people. They put mean, nasty preaching into people. They're blood and guts preachers. But if you read this Bible and you really realize who God is, it ought to wake us up. Right? When you realize that we move and have our being in Him, when you realize that our very breath comes from Him, you realize that He is in more control than what we give Him credit for, the Bible said in Deuteronomy 6 2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged you want to live a long healthy life fear God Amen. keep his commandments he said in Deuteronomy 10 12 and now Israel what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul you want to keep from fainting fear the Lord hmm? I, I look at some people and brother Ray and I have, have joked over the years there will be some people they only show up to church about once a month and they'll stand up and tell how blessed they are Brother Ray and I say, well, we ought to quit tithing, quit coming to church. Maybe we'll get blessed. Huh? The truth of the matter is, what they're saying is they're not bothered. Because when you're not faithful, the devil's not going to bother you because he's got you right where he wants you. But if you try to live for God and try to put God first in your life, try to pray and try to read your Bible, try to do things I'm preaching on tonight... The devil's going to park right outside your door to try to distract you, try to get you uh, to where you're defeated so you'll get back to being like these other people. Amen. Mm -hmm. But can I say, there's a little still small voice back in the pea brain of my mind that doesn't allow me to live like that, Brother Adrian. Amen. I love Jesus too much. I don't want to disappoint Jesus, but I do realize that everything I got came from the hand of Jesus, and I don't want him to cut all that off. Right. You say, you serve God because you fear him? Yeah, not because I'm afraid of him, but because I know better. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Listen, I wasn't afraid of my father, but there were some things I knew not to do because I knew better. Amen. He didn't light me up much, but the times he did was good enough. That even when I wasn't around him, I could still hear his voice in the back of my mind. Yes. Can I say I got a heavenly father that cares a whole lot for, more for me than my earthly father did? Yes. And can I say, he's, he don't have to get a chastening rod out to smack me around. But I do respect him enough and I do hear his voice enough uh, that I try to conduct myself not to dishonor him. Huh? Amen, Pastor. You want to keep from fainting? Fear the Lord. Hmm? When we fear the Lord, we have no problem reading the Bible, praying and talking to the Lord, listening to the right kind of music, uh, 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 being around the right kind of folks, having the right kind of fellowship. We have no problem with all that when we fear the Lord. You know the crowd that always gives the preacher problem? They sit there and they nod their head when he's preaching, but when they're away from him, they don't fear the Lord. They don't fear the man of God. They don't fear the house of God. They live however they want to. 
And then they'll thumb their nose up at the things of God. That vexes the preacher. I can't imagine how much that vexes God. But listen, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Amen. Uh, you, you'll, you'll really keep from fainting when you really get serious about the things of God. Let me say this lastly. <clears throat> this last point's going to be over two hours now to keep up with my two hours and 30 minutes, all right? What will keep us from fainting? The flames of hell. I'm not going to hell, but there's a lot of people around me that are. And I might be the only thing standing in their way from going to hell. And people dying and going to hell ought to keep me from fainting. Hmm? Amen. Listen, just like America, I believe this is the final stand. Yeah. Amen. And I really don't think it's close. Matter of fact, the only way that she'll be installed into the presidency is if they steal it. But I don't even know how they can do that this time. Too many people's eyes are open. Yeah. Right. But I think this is the final stand. And by the way, if we just put in Trump, that is not going to save America. They've got to do the Senate and the House. And they've got to put people in there that aren't snakes like some of the people in there that call themselves conservatives. But can I say, more importantly than that, this is the last stand for Christians. God gave us a space of grace when he put Trump in in 2016 because everybody thought Hillary had it in the bag. And Christians didn't take advantage of it. Now we went through four years of whatever it's been. I can't even wrap my head around how much our country has been destroyed in the last three and a half years. You'd think God's people would wake up and somebody get a hold of God and we'd have revival. But just as our country is in law and in denial, so are churches. Maybe the reason that storm hit the Bible belt so well is the Bible belt's been unbuckled for too long. We've got preachers that have more faith in Trump than they do God. God don't share his glory with anybody. And I still read in the scriptures it's God who sets up kings and people in authority. It's also God that sends revival. And nothing to bring revival more than us getting a burden for people dying and going to hell. The flames of hell ought to keep us from fainting. Too many people are dying and going to hell. I remember years ago I read a statistic that every hour 6,500 people go out into eternity. The vast majority of them die and go to hell. I read in Isaiah where hell enlargeth her borders. Amen. And I read in Matthew that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. I read in Revelation the size of New Jerusalem. It never gets any bigger. The reason hell is enlarged is because we don't charge the gates of hell and redeem the time for those that are in the balance headed that way. God help us to realize the flames of hell are real and people are headed there. That ought to keep us from fainting. Everything I mentioned tonight to keep us from fainting is all dealt with perspective and us being what Christians ought to be. If we live the way this book teaches us to live, we will not faint. God help us not to faint. Too many are. Too many dear saints of God are moving off the scene. Miss Annette and I was talking about her great-grandmother. I said, can you imagine your great-grandmother being in the church that she was raised in today? She said, it wouldn't be what it is today if she was still alive. See, those saints have moved off the scene. And some of us have moved up the ladder. 
what are we doing to hand down something real to the next generation? Amen. Too many are fainting. Too many are crossing over. And too many are fainting. But thank God for a remnant that wants to do right, live right, Amen. be right. And so I encourage you, do right, be right, live right. Don't faint. You're too important. You're too valuable. Too much is at stake. Too many people Amen. watching your life. Don't faint and don't give them cause to mock our God. Amen. Show them that Jesus is real. Show them transparency. That you and I may have problems and have troubles, but God is greater than our problems and our troubles. Amen. Show them Jesus in the midst of your valleys. God help us not to faint. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song. Miss Tina, if you'd be kind enough to come piano. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, thank you for that little simple parable. God, there's so many distractions and so many things coming against us that your people are wearied in their minds, and many of them, Lord, are about to faint. Lord, I'm thankful for our good church and the good solid people we got here. There may be even some here about to faint. Help us, God, to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and help us to put into practice these simple truths that, God, we wouldn't faint. Help us to be a true lighthouse on this hillside that others can see a path where they can come and experience Jesus Christ. God, speak to the hearts of your people. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Edify them. Help them in their inner man to be all they can be for Christ. Lord, we can almost see the lights of that city. And God, it's not time to step off the highway. It's time to put our heads down, our faces towards heaven like a flint, and give it our all because we know your imminent return is at hand. Bless down this invitation. Speak to hearts. God will bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.